So just before I start on my first slide, I realise that my title is actually incorrect because I put down um, alternative research careers. And really, the landscape has changed so much in the last 10 years that as PhDs, we need to be looking at the academic career pathway as the alternative career pathway. So just let that sink in for a minute. Now, I know a good few of you, um, and I don't know a good few of you, but I know that you're all either doing PhDs or have finished PhDs. Um, can I just get a show of hands who has, um, who's, who's doing a PhD right now? And who's finished PhD? And who wants to do one? Okay, so most people here mm -hmm. are PhD at some level. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> No, that, that's, that's not bad news, okay? You know, I'm not moving on from my first slide yet. It's not bad news. I think it's an absolutely wonderful opportunity because from now on, we need to start thinking of ourselves as um, professionals, science professionals, social professionals, technical professionals. So when you do a PhD, from the outset, you need to be very, very open to a broad range of career pathways, one of which is academia. And yes, one in 10 people will make it to a full tenured position in academia, but the rest of the people are going to be doing different things. And the good news is that employability and employment rates are high for PhDs. They're not particularly high, um, or not, it's not that they're not particularly high. Your chances of becoming a fully tenured professor are low, but your chances of excellent employment are high. Okay, so I'll move on from the first slide. So this is um, it's a 2010 report, but the graph is quite good because it's still very valid today. So it just gives you a kind of a basic idea of what is happening now. It's quite STEM focused, so um, it's not arts and humanities, but the Royal Society published a kind of like a landmark report the scientific century securing our future prosperity, uh, prosperity, and it just shows um, the pathways that um, have been taken by PhDs. So we see that 53% have worked into careers outside science, and over 47% who are in science, 30% um, stayed for early career, and um, of that 28.5% then went back into a career outside science. Um, 17% went to non-university research or industry careers, and if you look at the very end point here, 0.45% end up in professor positions. But that's not bad news, okay? And I suppose the whole thing um, that we're trying to do at the moment, people like myself and Mary and other people working in research administration, what we're trying to do is try and foster a culture change. So when you start a PhD, you're no longer thinking about a career specifically in academia. You could have a partial career in academia. So you could go and do your postdoc, you could do your senior postdoc, but still have the aim of getting out afterwards and, and moving into industry or business. Any questions so far? Okay, this is just from the, the NSF and doctor recipients from uni, US universities. Um, so there's just two graphs here, and they're looking at definite commitment at the doctorate award by a non-science and engineering field study from 1994 to 2014. Um, so we'll see here, uh, for example, the humanities, uh, just about 55% in 1994, uh, down to below that in 2014. And you can see that the general trend is, is slightly downward for that. Um, and it's quite similar for the um, definite commitments for the science and engineering field, but I see Tony here. Tony, what do you think of our graph? <laughs> uh, can you tell American figures? Um, the first one was English, so it's the Royal Society in England. There will be some Irish stuff coming up. This one is the NSF, so it's US figures. Okay, just a little bit about the academic career structure in general. Now, it's not all going to be all doom and gloom, guys, right? Um, just trying to paint a picture for you of the landscape at the moment. So the career structure has got many changes in the last 30 years, and the whole landscape has changed hugely in the last 10 years, even since I finished my PhD. I was just saying earlier to Fiona, it would have been quite easy for me to kind of um, step into an academic position after my PhD, but it has become increasingly hard over the last 10 years to do so. 
um, there's more uncertainty in terms of the traditional colour path. And maybe that's where we need to be looking at it. So the PhD into academia in the long term is the traditional career path. And what PhDs now need to be looking at is the bigger picture of all the different types of careers that you can have on a PhD by being a career professional. So um, a high degree of competitiveness, less possibility for new hires to obtain permanent contracts. And in general, the demand for positions is higher than the offer. So the measures designed to make universities more flexible and less financially liable in their staffing has made it a bit harder to achieve permanent full-time appointments and the short-term and fixed-term contracts are common. Um, and they do provide some degree of insecurity in the workplace. So as the number of students enrolling in Irish universities have increased rapidly, um, upward mobility has become more difficult, lecturers have less time to devote to research and are asked to devote more time to teaching responsibilities but if you're going for promotion, the first thing they're going to look at is your research portfolio, and so it's kind of a catch-22 in that situation. Okay, and then just on gender, um, yeah? I'd say professor means something different to these times. This is Ireland's... But even like European Institute professor, or even independent professor, okay. really, professor is really senior lecturer. Yeah, you know, they're not so we'll say senior about. lecturer to, to associate professor. To So just in terms of moving up the academic ladder, and uh, this is from um, science. So um, and this one, okay, it's 2011, but it's still quite relevant. So most people who obtain uh, PhDs in life sciences have set their sights on the academic career. Um, and this survey that was done in 2011 showed that 61% of former postdocs and 57% of current postdocs hope to get tenure track position after completing their postdoctoral study, so that was a hopes. But in reality, only a minor amount of PhDs actually end up in academic research careers. Um, so yeah, it does sound a little bit doom and gloom, but it's not, okay, because we're going to move on to better stuff shortly. This is the Vitae website. If you haven't been on it, it's a really good idea to look at it, because it gives really, really excellent career advice if you've got a PhD and if you're planning on doing an academic career or non-academic career. Um, and it gives really, really useful sort of uh, toolkits. Mary, can I just ask the Vitae one, are we signed up fully to Vitae or is it, we are signed up fully? Um, actually, what happened was um, Vitae approached the IUA, the Irish University Association, and um, said that they would give the Irish universities a reduced rate for our postdocs and normal researchers. And then Vitae asked for the numbers. And so I supplied the numbers for UBC and my counterparts in other universities did. And then Vitae said, no. So we can do an awful lot of work um, because they, I believe that the reason is that there weren't enough researchers in Ireland to make it financially um, uh, viable to them. So we used to only have partial. Yes. But having said that, the site actually does contain an awful lot of really relevant information. And um, I don't know, are you going to go into the training? No, I'm not. Talk about it's it. just to flag it because the postdoc hub, which Mary runs actually, it's an excellent resource. Have, have you been in engaged with the postdoc hub? It's really, really good. And there's lots of training for, um, for people who are going into research professionally. Well, it's not just that, it's also about what people call soft skills, which yeah. aren't actually soft skills at all. They're the hardest skills, um, like people management, you know, all of that. And uh, we do an awful lot of um, courses that you can go onto the HR research website and check, click on the postdoc hub. We also have professional skills for research leaders. That's for people who are at senior postdoc level or at research fellow level who are just about to go out and, you know, get their own funding, grow their own research groups. You know, if, if you know one of our graduates here this morning, it, it goes into it in, in a lot more detail. So uh, there's an awful lot of training and development um, available to you. Okay. So the next set of slides are a little bit about the non-research um, research career. 
So launching into that doesn't mean that you're going to be leaving everything behind from your PhD because you're not. You're going to be using it. Every single day in my job, I use the skills that I gained during my PhD. So the skills you developed as you dove into your projects and communicated your results are valuable in so many jobs. And if you're not convinced, there's a link here, um, sciencemind.org, and it gives a whole sort of uh, suite of information on the different types of um, careers that you can go into. So I'm saying it again, think of yourself as a professional, a science professional, a social professional, a legal professional, a technical professional. If you have a PhD, you are a professional. Okay, so careers and research support. So that's what I do. And um, I suppose I'll tell you a little bit about how, how I got there. Um, but I think this is interesting. So um, throughout her graduate training, Elizabeth Prescott had a suspicion that she wouldn't end up with an academic lab of her own. And her initial concern was that I would spend my days trapped in an office writing and begging for money, she said. So today, she spent her day happy doing exactly that. So she took a position in development and foundation relations at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Centre in Seattle. And joining the ranks of scientists who've left the bench or the lab or wherever it is that you are, uh, working on your PhD to help other scientists garner funding and establish the infrastructure needed to move science forward. And this is the key part. So due to increases in external support for research provided to colleges and universities, the number of people employed in grant writing and research administration is increasing. Although these employees are not directly responsible for the advances in science that result from university research, and I'm using the word directly because we're certainly indirectly um, responsible, they are facilitators. Securing the money, managing the organizational structure is essential for the research to move forward. So what does a research office do? I'm from the research office at UCC. So what we do is we oversee all the aspects of the grant management cycle, and we've got two sort of main areas. One is pre-award, which is what I work in. So I help researchers to bring in the money by helping them with their grants, and I work on a lot of kind of strategy areas as well, particularly around the area of research integrity. Um, a research administrator provides management support and helps ensure that research goals are achieved and that funder regulations are followed. We do a lot of work with the funders in Ireland, the main ones being the Irish Research Council, Science Foundation Ireland, the Health Research Board, um, and a number of other national sort of charities and other sort of philanthropic organisations, and also the international funding. So we're very involved in Horizon 2020 uh, on garnering uh, EU funding for research at UCC. It's a reactive job, so you'll get someone ringing you up at three o'clock going, I only found about this an hour ago and I really have to go for it and it's due like at five o'clock, can you help? And so you could be on the other end of the phone going, all right, I'm gonna have to drop everything I'm doing right now, I'm gonna have to get wood reviewed, drink some out, see if they can do it quickly, um, then I'm gonna have to get the thing burned off, if I need to review it around that they can actually sign, go on to find a signatory, try and glance through it to make sure the terms and conditions of the researcher isn't signing up to anything that they shouldn't be signing up to or that's gonna put them or the university at risk and all of that has to be done in two hours. So that's the reactive part of it. The proactive part of it is being able to develop strategy, being able to look at the bigger picture of what's going on in the research community. And I can say, hand on my heart, I wouldn't go back to being a researcher after working in this job because it is so fulfilling. So I know what's going on nationally in the research sector. I know what's going on internationally. I get opportunity to go to fantastic meetings where they're discussing strategy and development in the area. And that for me is hugely fulfilling. Okay, our, we provide solutions so that we're the conduit between the stakeholders, providing the knowledge and the expertise to address the challenges that are faced by the research community. And it's not just about bringing in money, there's a lot of other stuff that goes on behind the scenes. And one of the big things at the moment, which I've mentioned already, is the whole area of research integrity. And so there are kind of like big areas that are in kind of the research landscape that we have to look after as well. And at the moment, we're developing a strategy for research integrity training and development at UCC together with the National Forum. So if you like the following things, working with a wide variety of people. So I could have a physicist in talking to me about quantum stuff in the morning. I could go and meet someone then who is working in social care and they might be looking after uh, children with autism. Then I could meet someone who's working in pure mathematics. You know, and you get to work with these fantastic people um, 
wide variety of personalities. It's, it's really, really good. Um, you need to like writing. And I always loved the ideas at stage. I always loved being able to put the ideas down, make a paragraph look good, make it sell itself, um, love the writing end of things, and that's a big part of the job. If you love developing ideas, uh, I love developing the ideas more than I do actually doing them or finishing them. I like the development part of the idea. Uh, we do a lot of forecasting. So what's coming down the line? What's going to be coming down the line next year? Um, what kind of research priorities are going to change? Looking at the EU landscape, what's happening in Ryzen 2020? What are the work programs going to be like? What are the different strategy groups thinking of? We're heavily involved in that. And then we develop our UCC strategy on the back of that. So we keep an eye of what's going on internationally and nationally, and then we develop the strategy on the back of that. We look at the bigger picture. That's the bird's eye view of what's going on. Um, resource investigation. So say, for example, someone might come into the office and say, look, you know, I've got this really good idea. I really need to find someone to work with in the area of psychology. Can you help me? So then you might be able to put that person in touch with someone who can collaborate with them. They might need a particular piece of equipment that you might know about. So you put them in touch with procurement um, because you have to get your three different quotes. Um, so you, you work a lot in pulling groups together as well and making sure that researchers at UCC who have great ideas also meet other researchers at UCC and other universities who have great ideas that they can work together. We're also involved in a lot of event, event organization. So we have Fulbright coming down next week. Um, and we're going to talk to you about, uh, for whoever's interested, about getting a, a Fulbright award. Um, but we're, we constantly organize events from the different funding agencies, uh, nationally and internationally. So you have to like organize these things and you also have to be the type of person who likes working in customer service. Um, you have to be the type of person who, if someone rings you at half four or half five on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday or Friday, that you're okay to talk to them then. Okay, so you don't have to particularly love it, but you have to be okay with the last minute.com, which I've already talked about. So if someone rings you up at the last minute, but you're in the middle of a really intense review a researcher who has come to you weeks beforehand gave you a fantastic proposal to work on and you're working through it and someone rings at half four with the usual, I really need to sit by five o'clock, what can you do for me? So you have to be able to just drop what you're doing, go and have a look at their stuff for them as well. You have to be able to deal with the last minute.com because it happens a lot. And one of the big things is that you have to be okay with being in the background. So you'll get a thank you. If someone gets an award, you'll get a lovely thank you and it's great and that feels really, really good. But you will never be up there in the limelight. And you have to be okay with that. You also have to be okay with high pressure deadlines. Uh, a few weeks back, um, we had a, a call deadline with over 30 applications going in, and they were all big, kind of big sort of proposal programs. Um, so you have to be okay that you could actually manage that kind of thing. You know, working in research administration, you do end up being okay with that because you learn over time how to do those sorts of. Um, those manage, management um, you know, programs. You have to be able to work outside your field in the sense that you have to be able to work with a wide variety of researchers from a lot of different backgrounds. And so if you're the type of person who likes to work in the arts or the humanities or in public health or in physics, and you're not really that comfortable working on projects outside that area, um, <coughs> then research administration is probably not for you in that sense because you need to be able to work with people from a wide variety of backgrounds and a variety of personalities. You also need to be able to work with non-academics. So in the research office, we do a lot of going outside UCC um, and working with people who aren't in academia. So like work on Council, for example, or Enterprise Ireland um, and the different funding agencies. You have to be able to be structured in the sense that if you've 30 applications going in, you need to be able to make sure that they're all managed appropriately. And especially if you're responsible as the research office for actually pressing the submit button, if you don't press that, it doesn't go in. Um, you have to be able to be okay with that. And you also have to be okay with the idea that there could be no structure. So you have to be very flexible in that sense. There could be no structure because you may be in the middle of something and someone else will call you up and you'll have to just drop everything and go looking for them. So what kind of people are needed? 
support role experience. Most of you who do PhDs, you, you, you have already got this kind of experience. And I suppose this slide is, is, is quite about how PhD, um, people who are doing PhDs already have the skills that will allow them to, to, to be good research administrators, if that's the kind of role that they'd be interested in. You need to have really, really good communication skills. You need to have research skills and experience, depending on what part of research administration you go into. If you go into um, financial administration, you don't necessarily need to be good at the research skills and experience. If you're going into the HR end of things, you don't necessarily have to have the research skills and experience. But if you're going into the pre-award area, in which I work in, you are at, a, at an, a distinct advantage if you have these um, skills and experience from your PhD. You need good time management skills. We all know doing a PhD, you do end up being very, very good at managing your own time, especially if you're working part-time as well. You need the ability to manage data. You need to be empathic and supportive. You need to have good organizing skills. All of these stuff that you're learning or already have learned from your PhD. You need to have excellent writing skills. When I started my PhD, I used to give me back the uh, document and used to be covered in modern art. It was absolutely red and green and whatever color. And at the end of the PhD, it was only a few little marks. You know, and I suppose one of the great days was when he said, you can finally write, <laughs> which is wonderful, you know, because that was that whole experience. You learn how to write, it's a fantastic skill. Project management experience. Most of you doing PhDs are either managing your own project or part of a bigger project that's been managed and you're probably uh, doing some function of that. Marketing skills. It's a, a, an advantage, certainly. You don't necessarily have to have full on marketing skills. But as you're doing a PhD, even if you're recruiting applicants or recruiting subjects for your, for your work, you need to be able to go out there and advertise and sell the ideas. Excited by diversity, as I said, we work with a wide variety of researchers from so many different disciplines. You need to be excited by diversity and also be excited by other people's projects and not just your own, which is why I am doing research administration and not working in full-time research, because basically I wasn't excited enough by my own stuff. That is another thing. So, and I mentioned it to Fiona earlier uh, today. Um, is so one of the reasons why I'm working in research administration is because when I was doing my own research, I got a bit bored of it and I would move on to something else. And then I get a bit bored of that and move on to something else. Um, could never quite figure out why this was happening, but I was just excited by new things and the ideas phase, okay? You have to be a good team player, highly flexible, and this is an important one, happy without the limelight. It's only last year that I'm now totally happy that I'm not publishing anymore. Until then, I was like, oh God, I'd love to be able to publish again. Um, but I publish in a different way now. So we do lots of reports and lots of kind of strategy documents, etc. It's a different type of publishing. But it's only now that I am truly, truly comfortable not publishing anymore. You have to have good negotiation skills. This is another strong element. You need to be able to be extremely diplomatic and you need to be a bit of a politician in some ways when you're working in research administration, purely because you're getting to see what's happening at the, at the senior level in, in university administration. You need to be a person who is able to keep confidence. So people come into you with a really cool research idea and you want to tell someone else, well, you can't do that. Good presentation skills, I hope mine are good. <laughs> um, and you need to be ideas oriented. Okay, this is our website. If you haven't been on it, have a look at it and you can see who's working in the research office at the moment. If any of you want to come for a one-on-one -on -one or chat about research admin as a career, then you're more than welcome to come.